Welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab, where your host, Dave Lindahl, dissects recent multifamily deals done by his guests. Dave will extract what went right, what went wrong, and a number of key takeaways so your next deal may be more profitable. Welcome everybody to this edition of uh, Multifamily Deal Lab. I've got two gentlemen with me, uh, Mark Schuler and Josh Walsh, and they're gonna talk about the deal they did, 161 units in Houston, Texas, that had a gang in there. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit on how they uh, got rid of that gang. So uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves and tell everybody where you're from. Uh, sure, why don't I start? Um, I'm Mark Schuler. I've uh, been uh, practicing architecture for about 40 years out in Seattle. Um, been uh, associated with Dave for oof, almost 10 years now. Long time. And um, have just been uh, grinding away, doing deals. Uh, you know, it's a grind. If you think otherwise, uh, you're just mistaken. But, uh, you know, kind of a deal junkie. Um, I partnered up with uh, Josh about eight years ago, and uh, we've done several deals together. Um, yeah, it's been a good partnership. Um, Josh, why don't you take it from here? Great. So I'm Josh Welch. Um, my company is Three Pillars Capital. We're based out of uh, Houston, Texas. Been around since uh, 2017. Um, total portfolio count is roughly totally acquired about 4,000 units in total. We've sold some since then, but that's our kind of count since we started. Um, Mark's been a huge, you know, player and, uh, co GP with us in a lot of those deals. So, um, you know, his expertise really helps us, um, in a lot of different areas, especially when it comes to due diligence and just, you know, just common sense and, um, just his expertise in that, that space. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we're, you know, we're the value add focused multifamily shop. Um, don't do that, that much class A, mostly B and C, um, repositioning the assets. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun ride so far. How'd you guys meet up? Decide that you wanted to work together. That's kind of an interesting story. Um, I um, live in Puget Sound where, to put it mildly, government interference in the private market is uh, kind of a sport and knows no limits. Uh, the latest uh, intrusion is uh, City of Seattle is now limited late fees to ten dollars. So I have a forty unit I own here, and on March seventh this month, twenty six out of the forty units was late. <laughs> so um, the, so I got really tired of of doing deals up here. And I sold two of the three assets I had and started doing reconnaissance trips down to Houston. <laughs> you know, one of those trips I met Josh uh, through a mutual acquaintance who was a broker. Um, turns out we're both Michigan grads, both uh, went to Michigan engineering. Um, I tucked tail and ran over to architecture um, halfway through the program and just found that was a better fit for me. But uh, you know, we think a lot alike um, and certainly look at the business very similarly. So, you know, it's just a really natural partnership. And, uh, you know, we started doing deals together. So, you know, it's just uh, dumb luck, coincidence, you know, stars align, however you want to call it. But, uh, you know, we've been, uh, like I said, doing deals for about eight years now. Mm -hmm. All right. So this 161 unit deals in Houston, Texas. Uh, that's basically where you primarily where you guys do business. Um, you're you're set there. You don't you do, from what I my understand, you don't go into other markets usually. But that that's your home base and you guys know everything that's going on there. Um, much. so yeah. how did this one come up? How did this 161 unit deal come up? Well, this was part of a portfolio acquisition that I had known about um for three or four years. Um, and, uh, a lot of people tried to take it down is kind of what I heard, but, um, the sellers were a bit of a challenge to say the least. Josh can definitely attest to that mm -hmm. um, and managed to get it under contract. Um, and I think all in, how many units was it total, Josh? It was three assets and I don't remember the unit count. But, uh, right. So this is this, I think this is the first of the three. Um, right. so total units was, um, 688. Did you have to buy all three? We didn't have to buy all three. We started out with this one because this was a seller who has been um, kind of a god godfather in the Houston market for years. His yeah. family actually built these properties. They were built in the 80s. And um, 
we happen to be the second buyer to get it out of his, you know, to, to wrestle it away from the family because they didn't want to sell. They they were these kind of owners that kind of set it and forget it. And then the, the properties kind of went to the, the, the sons and the heirs and they were just making mailbox money. And that's what we've noticed happens in some of these older assets where, um, you know, they're it's held in the same family for years and they refinance it at some point. The, the loan, the, the basis and the deal is so low that they're making so much margin on their cash flow that they don't have to do any work. They can just sit back and collect a check. Um, that's great when you've had it for 30 years and you could do that. But if you're, if you're a new buyer operator coming in, you have to force value and you have to force income higher to, to make up for what you're now paying for that asset. And so, so this was the first of the three that we bought. And then about six months later, we bought the other two for a combined total of 688. So you had made the statement that they didn't want to sell. Was it? So who is like leading the sales of this? Who is, so, so my understanding, it's a family asset. And then now there's some that don't want to sell. And now there are some that do so do want to sell. So talk about that story. I think a lot of it was, um, you know, it was a dynamic. I think there was three in the family. Um, and the one guy was a little bit older than the rest. And he was just kind of ready to retire, really go sail to the sunset. And he, um, we, we were in with him. So we have, uh, at the time, we had somebody on our team that knew that family really well. He's our acquisitions director. Um, and so he was able to get us some meetings um, with him. And we kind of just got through this guy and said, look, if you really want to retire, we got, we'll, we'll buy it from you. We'll give you a great price at the time. And uh, it was an offer that was good enough. It was too good to refuse. And he was able to convince his other two partners or in the family that it was time to let go of it. So, and they did make up pretty well. Too good to refuse from him, but yet you saw for him, but yet you saw the uh, the upside potential. I see it's a C property in a B area, mm -hmm. so certainly there's some upgrading to do. Um, but describe a too good to refuse offer. Um, lots of hard money day one. Um, that yeah. was one thing. Um, very fast due diligence. So we're talking thirty days. Um, no financing contingencies. That's just a given. Uh, basically, to the point where even if the if the deal blows up and it's you know sixty days has gone by, they still walk away with a decent chunk of cash. Um, and I believe on this deal, I think it was half a million, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. So they're going to walk out with half a million no matter what, <clears throat> even if due diligence fell apart and has all sorts of issues, they were still going to do all right. And so I think that's really what. And they, we weren't the first people to go into this neighborhood and try to get these properties. So I think having the really strong hard money offer, um, and then. Um, you know, just the series, just how aggressive we were and how fast we moved. I think speed was key as well. Like we did not, we did not hesitate to get the LOI and then go straight to PSA. I mean, we were very quick about the whole thing. Excellent. Mark, uh, talk about uh, the upgrade C property B area. Where's the opportunity? What did you do? Yeah. Uh, to put it mildly, there's a little bit of deferred maintenance. Um, they had it built these in the eighties and then they self-managed forever. They were basically renting to anybody with a pulse um, for years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they never, you know, these type of family owned assets is I've bought these. I still own one here in town, in Seattle. And uh, there's this social contract that gets uh, kind of eventually gets into place where, you know, you pay your rents and don't complain and I'll keep rents low. And so they really didn't do a hell of a lot to kind of maintain the place. You know, so that's one thing. Um, the um, if I remember correctly, Josh, the partnership agreement had some crazy. Uh, didn't you have to go back and have them rewrite the partnership agreement before before we could close? Because there were like partners who had deceased like years ago. And am I reading remembering this correctly? Yeah, there was something to do with some Mexican entity that <laughs> made it a little sticky. Um, yeah. Yeah, we had to get a couple of different signatures in the sign-offs, um, which again was all on their end, but it could have easily derailed the deal and got the thing held up. So um, we did we did have to work through some sticky legal issues, but it wasn't it wasn't terrible from what I remember. Yeah. And then to answer your question directly, Dave, I mean our, our our standard program is to kind of do a condo quality finish on the interiors. So you know we're doing granite countertops, um, tile splashes tile vanities or excuse me granite vanities in the bathrooms you know upgraded mirrors and lighting package you know we do glass vessel sinks in all the bathrooms i mean it's really pretty nice finished level vinyl luxury vinyl plank uh, mm -hmm. plank flooring and the kind of the business model is to be uh 
command market plus 10% on the rents. So we're always trying to achieve our upside case on the rents. And, um, you know, if, and I don't think, gosh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you've never achieved your upside rents on any of the deals we've done. Yeah, we, yeah we've never had a situation where we're not able to achieve the upside case. Um, it gives us a lot of margin. I think, you know, what we look for is, not to digress, but, you know, we look for properties where the sub market is commanding a certain market rent. Like if you do, if you have a good product and, and, and the rent um, and the rent is here, right? If we find a property where the, the rent is not there and the product is not at the level of the rest of the market, we find those properties and we figure out what it costs us to do the work to renovate them to our level, which is usually a lot higher than the rest of the market. And then we still only target that top rent in the market. So like at the end of the day, all we're really doing is forcing value into the property. We're not banking on appreciation. So that's 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 really the secret behind the model is that we're not finding, we're finding the lowest hanging fruit where if you do the work, you'll get paid, right? So we're not looking, we're not waiting for the market to reward us because the market's going up. We're, we're, we're making the market reward us. For, for, for the, for the appreciation, valuation. Right. Um, so did that, Mark, did I hear you say that you're looking to get market plus 10% rents? Something like that. That's our upside case. Yeah. Um, and I mean, but, but believe me, our underwriting works at the base case as well. And mm -hmm. so um, all of our deals are like an APREF 20 plus IRR. And if we achieve the upside, well, we're just making all that much more for our investors. So, but yeah. we always underwrite to the base case. We don't, you know, we don't bank on anything. You know, we don't yeah. assume that we're going to make the upside case at all. Right. Um, so uh, per door, how much, are you, how much are you putting in per door? Oh boy, back in that era, three years ago, four years ago, I mean, I think we were at 16 to 17 a door, you know, mm -hmm. inflation and supply chain problems, that number's gone up since then. But, you know, it's a substantial lift. Yeah. Um, Josh can address this more than I can, but, uh, you know, his company is vertically integrated as well. Mm -hmm. So um, all the labor is in house, all the asset management and all the contracting help is in house on W twos. So the uh, expense side of the ledger is under control. Um, that cost for anybody else who is doing third party contractors and third party management would easily be twice that. Yeah, so, you know the equivalent for a, a different syndicator who's you know, hiring a contractor to come in is thirty two to thirty five thousand a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, good point. Good point. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, op uh, the opportunity when you start bringing things in house, when you start to scale, because I heard you say, Josh, you had 4,000 units. I remember when we were up around there, we started bringing, that's when we went to uh, our own management company. That's where we right. started our own make ready teams that were going from property to property. And right. yeah, the economies of scale is just makes yeah. everything so much better. Yeah. So with that type of, so with that type of a lift, how much, how much were you able to push rents per doll? Say hundred dollars per door, 150, $200 per door. Where, where were you lower? I mean, we're pushing rents. Um, and we're actually still increasing the rents today. Um, I, I want to say like maybe buck 50 to 200 a door. I mean, the, the rent increases on that particular project was about 20% across the board. Yeah. All right, good. And then, um, let's talk about the raise. How much was, uh, the property was 14, two. And uh, did you have to negotiate this property going in? Did you make an offer or did you make an offer? You said you made an offer you couldn't refuse or you made it easy to buy, but did, who set the price? Um, it was basically, we, I mean, the way that we operate is we will take, give me a set of financials and a rent roll and I'll tell you what I can pay for it. I don't care what you think you, you need for it. I'll tell you what I can afford and what makes money for me. And if it works great, if not, you know, we'll go on to the next one. So that's how this one happened is, you know, we got a set of financials. Um, some of it was based on sales comps, but, um, uh, most of it was just based on what, how the property was performing at the time. Um, and so we, we, we kind of backed into our sales price from there. Like we knew we needed to get a 20 IRR and something that was close to a eight, eight ish, uh, cash on cash annual yield. And so we found the price that, um, he was willing to accept that was right around that gave us those numbers. Did he accept your first offer or did he counter? Um, I, I want to say he accepted it because I think it was a lot more than they were ever expecting to get. <laughs> oh. So I think he was like, okay, take the money and run kind of thing. No, they didn't. They didn't really, if anything, the counter was in the terms, the, the price was never uh, negotiated after we, we gave him an offer. 
So they really didn't understand or, or could see the upside potential of that property. Yeah. And again, I think they, you know, the thing was held together by Band-Aids um, yeah. for decades. So they just, they were again, um, Band-Aid solutions didn't have a lot of CapEx dollars. So they, even if they wanted to, they'd have to go out and raise more money to pump back in to then bring it up to the level that we did. So, you know, you come up with a new group like us and we, we pump, uh, you know, millions of dollars into it and we raise the money. You know, we can do that. Right. But if you're an operator, you ran out of cash years ago and you've only, you know, you're just making, you're just banging on cash flow. It's really hard to want to put the effort to do that. If, if you catch my drift. Absolutely. Um, so if you're, so what was the raise of this property? I just looked that up. Um, it looked like uh, it was about seven point two. Yeah. Did that include the rehab cost? Two and a half million. Partly. You know, we back then we were doing uh, bridge to perm quite a bit. Um, so you know, for your listening audience that doesn't know or understand what a bridge loan is, you know, bridge loans will finance um, pretty high LTV. I, you know, I, did we go eighty percent on this one, Josh? Yeah, I was at eighty percent loan to cost. That was before COVID, though. I mean, this is yeah, yeah, lots of change since then. Yeah, but, but then, more importantly, explain why you used the bridge loan in this particular circumstance. Well, because they financed a big chunk of the renovation as well. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to go out and raise. We raised part of that uh, rental cost, but um, the bridge loan will pay for uh, quite a bit of the renovation. So you, that's just part of the loan. And then, you know, there's this complicated draw process you go through every month as you uh, grind through the renovation, you get reimbursed. Very complicated, so, depending on which lender you use. Did you use a Fannie Mae's bridge to, per bridge to perm deal? No, it was, um, it was a different bank. It was, it was a debt lender out of New York. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times Fannie's, we found that the Fannie stuff doesn't really work for what we do. I, um, there's just a lot of, uh, I mean, it can work for some people. I just think that our, our speed of what, how we need to, we, we try to get the renovations done very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, we target about 5% a month so that at the end of two years, which is usually aligns with these loan terms, we're done with the work and we can refinance out of it. Um, just some of these other debt programs are less, a lot more flexible. The speed of the draws are a lot faster. So we don't tend to work with Fannie on those. I've done a Fannie draw loan before, and it was the brain damage I went through to try to get those draws. <laughs> Pulled was um, mm -hmm. excruciating. So I, I learned I never want to do another any more like that. Yeah. Um, the raise, where did you get where did you get the raise? Where'd you find the money? <laughs> you know, um, it's kind of an all hands on deck exercise for us. I mean, we're we're wrapping one up right now. Um uh, you know, it, it's just um you do enough of these for a long enough period, you just get quite an investor database put together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, back then is more of the beginning of the exercise for us. So, um, it's like just all hands on deck, go find money mm -hmm. and uh, you hit up everybody you can find. Um, I don't recall how long it took us to do this one, but you know, we were able to get it done pretty quickly. This one wasn't bad. I, I, I do know that we had, we had a pretty big seed investor. So we have a couple of family offices that we, we tap mm -hmm. into. They're, they're usually good for, mm -hmm. you know, half to three quarters of the stack, um, which then makes it easier to fill in the rest. Um, which I think is key. If you're doing any type of big deal, it's really important to get some big seed investors that you know that no matter what, you know, you've got at least half of it. And that also helps give confidence to other smaller investors. Like, hey, look, I've already got half the stack come in on the equity. They're, they're a million dollar plus check writers. You know, I've got it taken care of. It, gives, it helps give confidence too. Do you typically do a webinar presentation to the other, uh, to the other stack? No. Oh, really? I mean, every once in a while by request, if there's like a group of guys that like, Hey, I want to invest, you know, 3 million. Can you do a small presentation? Sure. I'll do that. But we don't do, um, like one big broadcast for the entire uh, database. So you you know, can, to be candid, we fill our deals so quickly that, um, we've had more than one deal where we were scheduled to do a webinar and, uh, the raise got done before we had a chance to do the webinar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tend to bypass that step. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> so okay, so we went through the raise. Uh, so tell us about the gang. I see in the uh, the notes that uh, you wish you knew there was, there was a gang there, and you. Yeah. You know, so what? I think that was in the next door asset, if I'm remembering correctly, Josh. Is that correct? You talking about the one that we then picked up six months later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is I mean, where. You have a mailbox money owner who rents to anybody with a pulse. Josh, I'm going to let you take it from here. 
Yeah. I mean, um, it kind of just, just going off of what I said before you have, when, when it's just that easy and you got such, you don't have to do that much effort to, to make a, a decent return every month. You kind of just, you start letting your operations kind of slow down. You kind of, you even employ people with a pulse. So some of these managers that they had on site, I mean, they were still, believe it or not, they were still doing leases on typewriters when we took over, <laughs> um, wow. which is like unheard of. Like I've never, that's the only time I've ever seen that. Um, yeah. And, you know, these people were paid super low wages, um, so they didn't care. They were not incentivized. Leasing agents were not being incentivized on new leases. And so they literally were just, hey, as long as I, I can keep my job, as long as I keep it 95%, I don't care who comes in here. I don't care what your job is. I don't care how much you're, you can pay on the deposit. Just like, hey, give me 50 bucks. Okay, come on in. Like it was bad. So it, what happened is it just became known as the spot on the street where, okay, you know, gangbangers and thugs could hang out. And it was like, where it was like their central. So we had a little bit of that at this first property. And then those people all got evicted very quickly because they, once they realized that we were actually coming and kind of swinging the hammer and, and land down the law, they, they kind of, they, they left very quickly. And they went to the property next door, door which is uh, what we wound up buying six months after that. So we had to kick them out again. But, you know, you fast forward two years, you know, we had to do things like beef up security, you know, do a lot of branding with the property, like a lot of marketing, just to kind of change the name, like just change the face and, and what people thought of it. It took a while, it took a couple of years, but I think I, it's safe to say we're past that point now and it's no longer seen as gang or heaven and leasing is tremendously picked up. I think that's the other reason why we're able to push the rents because you don't have that presence in those properties anymore. So people can feel it when they go outside. And so they want to tell their friends to live there and they feel safe to be there. So it made a huge difference. Yeah. It was a good opportunity to be able to pick up that property next door, because if you couldn't, that would have been a big problem through the years, you know, not getting rid of the, being able to get rid of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, I had that happen to me in Austin, Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. We get rid of everybody, but they went next door and then that owner didn't care and he didn't yeah. care to sell either. Like, damn, man, that made that property a difficult one to it's run. It's gone on three doors. It's gone far enough where they can't mess with your property, you know? Did you have to change the names of the properties? We didn't. In hindsight, maybe we should have, but we didn't. We, we kind of just stuck through it. Yeah, I always say, you know, when you're doing like a, a repositioning like that is you've, the, you know, you got to change the perception of the property in the neighborhood. And you know you've won when you get somebody to move in and they actually refer to a friend. Mm -hmm. like, okay, now we start, this thing's starting to turn around, which is good. Yeah. Um, all right. So, and what was that? Uh, what did it cost you for security on that property? I mean, there were some months where it was, um, I mean, definitely a lot more spend in the beginning, you know, at least 10 to 15,000 a month. Um, and then of course, after we got a lot of the bad apples out that we were able to cut that back. And I think today we're around a few thousand dollars a month and that's just weekend patrol and a couple of times a night <clears throat> on uh, oh. weekdays. Awesome. Awesome. You didn't have to put a security gate across the entrance to the property. Outlet. Yeah. You, that, you um, did? Oh, yeah. yeah. On both of them or just one? Both. It was just the one next door, right, Josh? We did no, no, both. Um, oh, you did do both. All right. Yeah. Because just for, I mean, we actually sold this. So the first the deal we're talking about, they already sold it. Um, so, but we oh, sold you've it. already sold this deal that we're talking about? Yeah. Oh, what was the return? Uh, this one was a 43% total net return. What'd you sell it for? So did you sold it for 20 something? It was, uh, Mark, you remember the exact price? I think I should know this. I don't. Um, I know it was, it was a good deal. Uh, hold yeah, on. You know, because when you punch the rents up as fast as we did, Dave, and you yep. know, turn around and sell it real quick. I mean, I think we sold this in a little over two years, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, 20. it was just. Yeah, it was, it was just, it was exactly two years, almost to the day. It's kind of, so, you know, the IRR on that, you know, giving the investors their money back that quickly on that, especially that profit on the back end, mm -hmm. the IRR had to be up in, you know, 35%, something like that. I mean, yeah, it was really, it was, yeah. I mean, definitely over 20 um, because I mean, again, our investors got paid really well and, and most of that did come at the end. Right. Um, so so yeah, that's definitely going to be a little bit higher than, than 20. Um, I mean, we I, say the least we performed the way we said we were. Yeah. Awesome. It sounds like even better. Uh, so a couple, I want to ask you guys uh, the most inspirational books you've read, what you're reading now, uh, the most inspirational movie 
uh, that you've had. And then I'm going to give out, ask you to give out your contact information for anybody that may uh, want to contact you. <laughs> so uh, how about the first uh, inspirational book, Mark? Uh, inspirational. Um, and I've read so many, Dave. Um, the one that, you know, I've read a lot regarding uh, the business. Um, yeah. I've also read um, a lot about the Rockefeller habits. Uh, you know, I've just read a lot of books about how to... Uh, choose one. If you're going to recommend one book to somebody, what would it be? Choose one. And of course, there's the Lindahl books. Those are always great. Um, yeah, well, those are the greatest. We're just looking for the next year down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably the you know the uh, Rockefeller habits and uh, those are I've read that book you know probably I don't know how many times. Wow! And uh, you know it just um, you know there, I always get a new nugget out of that. It's a classic, and yeah. uh, but you know the the wisdom imparted through in that book. I think it, you know. That take ten of these other books off the shelf, and you just read that, and you and just read it once a year. You learn something new every time. Excellent, Josh. How about you? Most inspirational book? I would say, you know, memory is going to kill me here. The one that I can remember that's the most inspirational is going to be uh, Traction by Gino Wickman. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Once I understood how you know people kind of um, come together in tribes, and you know everything's about accountability and building each other up, and everything's teamwork based. Did did you use that as an operating system or do you use it now as an operating system? We are, yeah. Yeah. We just implemented it this year. So yeah, it's I, usually impactful. Did you do it yourselves or did you use an implementer, hire an imp implementer too? No, I well. mean, you talked about it, but um, we just hired, a, um, our, he's now the CEO of the management company. Um, but he came in with a, a lot of background in implementing that system already. So he brought his expertise and brought it into our team. Excellent. Mark, what are you reading now? A lot of financial reports. Um <laughs> You know, I can't really, I don't have time to read right now. I've got so much going on that um, I just can't uh, take the time to, you know, sit down and read a book. And that's, okay. uh, I Josh. want to, but uh, I'm trying to kind of take care of the deal in Mississippi. No problem. Josh, uh, what are you reading now? I'm going to read right now. I'm actually, listen, I like audiobooks. So my audiobook right now is, uh, it's called The Four Hour Body by this guy named uh, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Tim Ferriss. It's basically like, how do you, find these life hacks to like lose a bunch of weight and, but in a healthy way and yeah. understand how your body can like burn fat, not carbs, but like, what's the science yeah. behind? So mm -hmm. it's pretty yeah. interesting. That's a good book. Yeah. Um, okay. Movie, most inspirational movie, Mark. Oh boy. Um, well, you know, my dad was a, um, aviator in world war two. Yep. And so I, uh, the older I've gotten, the more I appreciated, uh, Kind of the greatest generation. So I tend to watch a lot, you know, I, I, I find those types of movies really inspirational. Um, Saving Private Ryan, I've probably watched eight times. Have you seen Unbroken? Uh, I don't think I have. No. Oh, it's an awesome movie about a POW that just wouldn't uh, give any information and they, they just broke, tried to break him and they couldn't. It's a true story. It's a book and it's a true, uh, it's a true story. It's just awesome. Um, you know, I'm uh, always fascinated by, that you know, I'm from Detroit, and so um, grit has a big meaning to me because that's just kind of how that city works and operates. And yeah, you know, you can't quit. You know, you just can't quit. And so many people in life quit, and it just is mind-boggling to me because you you just got to be the last guy standing, and you'll be successful. And um, that's, that's kind of been my mantra throughout my life. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I mean, you understand, you know, I was part of that 10 paths book and I talked about that a lot. And that interview is like, you just can't quit. And so, uh, growing up in that environment, I'm definitely, you know, from a blue collar working class background, you know, everybody in my family worked the line. Uh, one of my uncles got out of the factory grind and became a brick mason. Hmm. And, uh, so, you know, um, you know, I wanted something more out of life. I didn't want to kind of work with my hands. I'm not built to be a laborer. So, you know, I just kind of like dug deep and uh, propelled myself forward. And it's all self-determination. I'm a big proponent of that. So, Awesome. Josh, 
movie. You have plenty of time to think about it now. Yeah, I was going to, well, I've only actually seen it once, but I, from what I, if we're talking about super inspirational, The Pursuit of Happiness, that is a phenomenal oh, yeah. Will Smith movie. Yep. You want to talk about a guy who doesn't quit, who made a lot of mistakes and then somehow found a way to strive through it, man. That is a tearjerker and an inspirational movie. All the time. And a true story. And a true story. Yeah. All right. Listen, guys, give out your contact information. If anybody wants, if anybody wants to contact you. Mark. Yeah. And I can, uh, you can hit me up at, uh, S G R E investments, plural.com. And it's just Mark at S G R E investments. Yeah. All right. And Josh. Uh, so three pillars capital that's T P C G cap.com. Mm-hmm. And I'm Josh W at T P C G cap.com. Awesome. This has been another edition of multifamily deal lab. This has been another edition of multifamily deal lab. If watching on YouTube, please be sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, so you don't miss the next session and review the contact links on this page.